Hello there. I have a question for you. Can Kerbal Space Program be an esports game? And if so, how? That is a question that I found myself asking back in September when I discovered that SpaceCon 2023 was running a Kerbal Space Program esports contest with proper sponsors and credentials and everything. And so, you know, I couldn't resist looking into it. And before long, things had got a bit carried away and I'd recruited fellow YouTuber The Beardy Penguin as a teammate and bish bash bosh, we were suddenly an esports team. <sighs> One euro star to Paris and hotel check-in later, things were getting real. But let's backtrack. What the devils is a Kerbal Space Program esports event? I mean, it's not like KSP has any real-time competitive aspect to it, so how was all of this going to work? Well, luckily for us, it turns out that this wasn't the first time this event had taken place, so I could look at previous years to see what it was. And it turned out what it was, was this. Your team is given a challenge, and then you have a fixed amount of time to complete that challenge, and then you have to present a quasi-lecture to a panel of experts about why your mission was great, successful, and why your team deserves to win. The difference this year though, rather than a mere six-ish hour time frame, the challenge would be a full uninterrupted 24 hour event. But being professionals, me and Beardy reckoned we had this in the bag. So along came the competition day itself and given that we were the only English team, we wanted to make sure we represented our country in a professional and culturally sensitive way. So naturally, we rocked up dressed like this. <laughs> No one else has a team costume, it's just us. I can feel the hatred, just... <laughs> then came the announcement of the challenge. All the teams would be playing in real solar system, albeit Kerbal scale, and the challenge would be to land 10 tons of cargo on Mars. The twist? The game part prices had been edited to make fuel prohibitively expensive and the nuclear engine essentially priced out of the game. So the ask was this use the moon to establish some kind of gateway for interplanetary missions with in situ resource utilization or you know mining to gain fuel on the cheap and facilitate economic mars missions so the stage was set we were ready and we didn't even have to worry about our online identities being compromised during the challenge because of course we used Incogni, sponsor of today's video and the powerhouse that's putting you back in control of your online life by keeping your personal data safe from those pesky data brokers and trackers. We live in a world where our online information seems to have a life of its own. But fear not, Incogni steps up to the plate, negotiating with data brokers to give them the boot and ensuring that your personal information stays where it belongs with you. Incogni takes the hassle out of the process. It's on a mission to automatically seek out and wipe out your data from brokers across the web, reaching out to them on your behalf and putting an end to the data collection madness. And why should you care? Well, imagine your data being tossed around like a hot potato, leading to denied bank loans, higher insurance rates, and even the risk of identity theft. According to the Identity Theft Resource Center's 2022 annual data breach report, the number of victims has spiked by almost 41.5% from the previous year. Incogni keeps it simple with affordable pricing options. Opting for the annual subscription means they'll keep sending removal requests for as long as you're on board, ensuring your data isn't just removed, but stays removed. Ready to take the reins on your privacy? Well, join the growing community saying goodbye to data breaches and hello to peace of mind. And here's the kicker. The first 100 people using my exclusive code MATLOWN will get an incredible 60% off on Incogni's services. So don't miss out. Click the link in the description to fortify your privacy with Incogni today. But anyway, the challenge was set. We were ready. Let us begin. With the challenge laid forth, we all rushed to our battle stations. And upon firing up our PC, a problem was immediately identified. Being the ignorant Brits that we are, we had no idea that the QWERTY keyboard layout wasn't standard across Europe. Luckily, the keyboards were mechanical, so I sacrificed my fingernails to pry the letters off and rearrange the keyboard to the QWERTY layout. So, one hurdle crossed there, but there was also the matter of changing the keyboard layout in Windows 11, which unfortunately was also in French. 
So we had to try and navigate an OS neither of us had used before in a language neither of us speak very well. And when we finally found the language options, UK English wasn't selectable for some reason. And like heck were we going to use Yankee Doodle Do English, so Aussie English it was. With that fixed, the final thing needed was to set the KSP in-game language to English and keyboard layout to QWERTY and then it was time. How long did that take? So we got to work, coming up with a highly detailed plan in Notepad. We would conduct our mission in three phases. Phase 1, establish lunar infrastructure in three launches. Phase 2, establish Martian infrastructure to support a crewed mission. And Phase 3, do the crewed mission. It was ambitious, but the beardy Brits play for keeps. Anyway, during this initial planning, Starship Flight 2 decided to happen, so we took a quick break to watch it blow up. <laughs> then, it was back to work. Now, we spent a lot of time meticulously designing and testing every aspect and vehicle of the mission to ensure everything worked as planned. We did all of this while we could see other teams actively start launching stuff, but we knew our patience would pay off. Eager to do the more fun stuff first, we set off designing all of the Mars infrastructure. Firstly, an awesome habitat module that inflates, i.e. some pistons extend some clipped crew modules to simulate inflation, as well as slapping on some fancy robotics programming for the comms tower. Oh, did I mention that the game also had both DLCs installed? I don't know if I should have mentioned that. Anyway, we tested that this could land under parachutes and engines, then it was time to design the Mars Ascent Vehicle that would land on Mars uncrewed and unfueled, the idea being that it would mine and synthesize its own fuel over the two years between Mars transfer windows. We then tested that this could indeed land safely, and then launch a three-person crew from the Mars surface to Martian orbit with over a kilometer of Delta V to spare for rendezvous with the mothership. Okay, so a tad overkill. <laughs> and then it came came to designing the Crew Rover, which could ferry Kerbals between the habitat and the Crew Ascent vehicle in the likely event that they'd be miles apart. And we then tested this vehicle and its fancy sky crane to once again establish if it all worked. Then we needed to build atmospheric shielding for all three vehicles for their Mars descent, so enclosed fairings and ablative shields for the Hab and Rover, and an aft inflatable heat shield for the chonkier ascent vehicle. And after adding some deorbit engines and fuel tanks to each module, and docking ports that allow them to be stuck together in low Earth orbit, we then designed a transfer vehicle that could take them all the way to Mars. Essentially, this was just a giant fuel tank with an engine. We tested all the Delta V readouts would work in the space plane hangar with everything stuck together. Of course, the transfer vehicle would be launched empty. It would fill with fuel using the moon base. Speaking of which, it was then time to design that. The moon vehicles would be crucial to our plan working. Remember that the goal of this competition was not just tonnage to Mars, but utilizing the moon as a refueling space as much as possible. To that end, we set about designing the three things required. Mining base, fuel surface to orbit shuttle, and gateway space station, all of which would function completely uncrewed. First up on the to build list was the mining base, which we opted to make mobile so that it could easily relocate if it dries up all resources at its current parking spot, and also to make life easier when it came to somehow docking it to the landing shuttle, which would be achieved by using a docking port on a robot arm. After testing it and being satisfied with its performance, we moved on to designing the fuel shuttle. We started off by adding the same two fuel tanks used by the transfer vehicle. These would be launched empty and filled up via the mining station on the lunar surface. The shuttle vehicle itself would need to have the necessary Delta V to carry these fuel tanks back to lunar orbit and then perform another moon landing before the shuttle could refuel itself. So we surrounded the orange tanker core with lots of Mark II size fuel tanks with eight Terrier engines to power it. After figuring that the delta V and thrust to weight ratio numbers mathematically all worked, we moved on to the final part of the lunar stuff, the gateway space station. 
for simplicities and time savings sake, we made this a single launch monolithic station with lab and cupola crew modules, as well as a probe core, comms and solar array, and enough docking ports to allow the Mars transfer and fuel transfer shuttles to simultaneously dock to the station to allow refueling to take place. It also sported a resource scanner, which could scan the moon's surface from its location in polar moon orbit. But the completion of the design of our gateway space station meant that we had now built everything required for phase one and two of our mission plan. Phase 3 was always a only do it if we have time at the end type thing, so everything we needed to have ready for launch was ready. But before we could launch anything, we needed a rocket. Since the objective of the challenge was all about minimizing resource use and saving costs, it just made sense to have a reusable rocket, and for realism's sake, that left us with only two options, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. We started off with construction of a Falcon 9 replica with a recoverable first stage and expendable second stage, with the hope that it would be capable of carrying everything we had built to orbit without requiring the use of either expending the first stage or requiring Falcon Heavy. We also wanted to be able to destroy the second stage, either through staging it in a trans-atmospheric orbit or through lunar collision, in order to reduce space clutter and contamination. Happily, the Falcon 9 that we ended up building was capable of doing every single launch right down to be able to retain an identical fairing size, so we could hypothetically reuse the fairing halves if this was something possible in Kerbal Space Program. The landing legs for the booster were created using the hinges from the Breaking Ground DLC, and then I think we did a pretty good job matching the aesthetics of Falcon 9 Block 5's legs by using the big S-wing strakes for the legs themselves. The way we certified that the rocket was capable of carrying out its missions was to have it launch our heaviest intended payload, the Lunar Surface to Orbit Fuel Shuttle. The rocket blasted off the pad, soaring skyward. We then created a quick save with 700 meters per second of delta V in stage one to spare before staging and conducting a boost back burn, descent, and a close enough attempt to successful landing to leave us happy with the rocket. Oh, and the second stage successfully got the payload to space as well, but I don't want to spoil the missions themselves just yet. But that was it! We had a launch vehicle, every single required payload, so we were ready to begin our first real mission. So we made a new save file, imported all the crafts and sub-assemblies we needed across, and prepared for Flight 1. Flight 1 was a super important one, not just because it would place our Lunar Gateway space station in moon orbit, but also because it was the maiden flight of our Falcon 9, in which we would need to prove to the judges that it could indeed send payloads to orbit and to propulsively land itself back at the Kerbal Space Center. With the judge watching, we staged with 900 meters per second of delta V remaining, and then proceeded with the landing, which I believe went pretty well. We made a named quick save that we could reload later to fly the second stage, and then commence our boost back burn. After getting our trajectory to roughly where the Kerbal Space Center was, we then deployed the stand-in for the grid fins, which were just the air brakes, and proceeded with the descent. Again, making sure that this was all seen by one of the competition judges. The reason for having a judge watch was because once we had proven on an official level that we could recover our first stage after staging with 900 meters per second remaining, we could then just expend the Falcon 9 first stage on all subsequent flights, provided we always staged at 900 meters per second remaining, and simply pretend that we had recovered it in order to save time. This was all within the rules of the contest. If you could prove you had a rocket capable of launching a given payload mass and size, then you could just use the cheat menu to fast forward through certain other missions. During a spot of corporate espionage, one of our rival teams, SSTO, explained to me how they were going to build a moon base using this rule, and it was pretty clever in my opinion. <laughs> uh, and the, the, the entire thing is because we have to launch this base in five segments, but each of these segments is tailored to be exactly the same height and volume, and also nearly the same mass. So we're going to do is qualify the same launch vehicle for a 15 ton TLI payload and then when we prove that the first flight is good we're just going to spawn all five on the surface actually, do yeah. the assembly on the surface and then get the lander anyway enough about showcasing the enemy 
With the Falcon 9 first stage certified and approval given that we could, from now on, operate on the basis that we would hypothetically always be recovering the Falcon 9 first stage booster, provided of course we staged with 900 meters per second of Delta V remaining, it was time to load back to stage separation and continue with the Gateway mission. Well, actually, due to the fact that we accidentally put the wrong mission flag on it, and being the perfectionists we are, we actually just reverted to launch and did it again, in case any eagle-eyed viewers pick up on any discrepancies with the altitude gauge or something at stage separation. Anyway, that's long in the past. Cruising to low Earth orbit was a breeze. Remember that while this is real solar system, it's at Kerbal scale, i.e. one-eighth the size of real life, so orbit is just as easy as it is in KSP. Then we had to set a course for the moon, which, of course, is a bit trickier in RSS because the moon is at a super inclined orbit, but it's not an issue for us. With our route planned out, we began executing the first of our burns to place the space station in moon orbit. The station was actually one of the lightest payloads we launched, hence why we got so much mileage out of the Falcon 9 second stage. Now, don't worry, we won't be leaving it blocking the cupola module. Once we're in polar moon orbit, we'll place the whole thing on an impact course with the moon's surface, then detach the second stage to allow it to crash harmlessly, uh, but then use the orbital reboost engines on the station itself to course correct to ensure that it stays in moon orbit and, you know, doesn't crash on the surface of the moon. Now, don't worry, there are going to be a lot of launches and missions and whatnot in this video, and I don't plan on showing everything in its entirety for the sake of brevity more than anything else, but I thought I'd show you most of the recorded footage we have for the Gateway Station mission, just so that you can see the performance of the Falcon second stage, and what a journey to the moon in Kerbal Scale Real Solar System looks like. In subsequent missions, I'll just show the key moments and bits that I thought were good. And this is a bit I thought was good, right? Arriving at the moon to put ourselves in orbit. You might have caught it on screen earlier, but we deployed the ore scanner, not because we were going to do a resource survey, because you can't when you're not in orbit, but we wanted to see what the orbit parameters were in order for the ore scanner to work. So that when we circularized, we would indeed be circularizing in an orbit in which the scanner can be used. But speaking of circularizing, that's what we've just done, and in fact we deorbited briefly so that we could, as I mentioned earlier, ditch the Falcon second stage and let it crash into the surface of the moon, and then we used the boost engines on the station to get ourselves back into a nice safe orbit. Then we can deploy the piston that has the resource scanner on it, and of course deploy the solar array as well, and we can begin our ore scan and get ready to launch our mobile mining station. Here are the results of the ore scan, and with that, launch one was a success. So, as mentioned, launch 2 would be the launch in which we would send our mining base to the moon's surface, specifically to an equivalent location to Shackleton Crater, an impact crater at the real-life lunar South Pole region, notable for the fact that the peaks along its rim receive near-continual sunlight, while the crater's interior is in perpetual shadow, functioning like a cold trap that may capture and freeze volatiles from comets impacting the moon, making it an ideal place for harvesting resources for our mining base, which, by by the way, we named Mogensen Mining Base after ESA astronaut Andreas Mogensen, ISS commander, to hopefully score some brownie points with the judges representing ESA in the competition. And there is the touchdown of the rover and its sky crane. Is it really a sky crane when there's no atmosphere? I don't know, let me know in the comments below. Wasn't the most graceful detachment of the sky crane, but everything was in one piece, so we took this as a win. All it took was to retract the landing legs, and then we could drive to a flatter spot and redeploy the solar arrays, and of course the radiators. But no mining yet, because there's nothing to refuel. That comes with mission number three. This would be the heaviest payload our Falcon 9 had launched yet, but since this was the payload that we used to certify the rocket could perform as needed, we knew things would work out. But, unlike the previous two launches, the Falcon second stage would have insufficient Delta V for a moon transfer burn, and instead it was detached before reaching a stable Earth orbit, to again ensure that no debris was left in space. Because the moon lander was relatively lightweight at this point, given that its tank tanks were empty, it had enough internal Delta V to not just get to the moon under its own steam, but also perform a lunar landing. 
I managed to land it in a roughly similar location to the mining base, which, of course, was good enough as we could then drive the base over to it and begin the very fiddly process of docking the two together. This was something that we hadn't actually tested beforehand. Risky strategy, I know, but everything looked okay on paper. The docking port on the lander was static, but on the rover it was attached to an extendable piston, with a hinge and rotation servo at either end, giving it full, albeit somewhat awkward to operate, articulation, and with a bit of playing around with the slightly stressful added challenge arising from the fact the lander was slowly sliding across the surface, the two were docked. And before someone comments that we could have just used the claw, that just feels a bit more cheaty and unrealistic than the docking port solution we went with, so take that. Anyway, with connection between the two vehicles established, the mining base could deploy its solar arrays, radiators, and of course drill, before firing up the ISRU to convert the mined ore into delicious oxidizer and liquid fuel. It took a few in-game days to fully fill the tanks, but of course, only a mere moment for us thanks to Time Warp. Anyway, with fueling complete, the lander could take off and head towards the Lunar Gateway space station. Now, like with validating our Falcon 9, this entire process is watched over by a judge. In order for our Mars mission to work, we would need to do multiple trips to and from the moon's surface with our refueling vehicle, which we didn't really have time to keep doing. But if we just prove that it could do it the once, get to the space station, transfer all of the fuel contained in the orange tanks into the Mars transfer vehicle, undock from the station once again, and then land on the moon surface where it could then, you know, redock to the mining base and fully refuel itself, we could then have it approved for simulated reuse, as it were. As in, having proven that the whole system worked, each time we needed the Mars transfer vehicle refueled, we could just use cheats to refill the fuel shuttle's tank tanks while it still docked to the space station, all within the pre-established rules of the contest, save us having to keep going down to the surface to get fuel manually each time. Now we had a judge there and we didn't really want to have to keep bringing them back when we got to certain aspects of the mission, so we quickly tabbed out of the game and then manually drained the refueling tanks using Notepad Plus and then showed that it could land back on the moon surface with the fuel it had remaining in its own tanks. But we paused OBS for this for some reason, I'm not sure why, I think we were just tired or something. Either way I didn't actually get this captured on video, but a judge saw it, and a judge gave us verbal approval, and you can see from the Delta V readouts on screen that mathematically, this thing can do another landing, it's fine. <laughs> and so, it was on to launch number four, the final launch of phase one, and this launch was to get the Mars transfer vehicle ready. Here it is launching on Falcon 9, empty, so Falcon 9 second stage has plenty of Delta V to get it all the way to the Gateway space station. Well, actually, I tell a small lie there. There was a small amount of fuel in the transfer vehicle's tank so that we could quickly place the ship on a surface collision course, dump the Falcon second stage, and then reorbit with the transfer vehicle and perform the docking with the gateway station before commencing the first of our refuels. But the mission wasn't over yet. The next set of launches would be to support phase two, and there was no way that the Falcon 9 second stages would be able to get their payloads to gateway. Instead, they would all dock to the Mars transfer vehicle in low Earth orbit. So we needed to get the transfer vehicle parked in low Earth orbit, ready to receive the three Mars modules. And whilst I said all of that, that's what's just happened on screen. So there we are. Phase one is complete. Now it's time for phase two. Now, I mentioned earlier that when a launch vehicle is certified in this competition, you can just use cheats for any future launches that have payloads of equal or lesser mass. But we didn't take advantage of this for our Falcon 9 until now because we weren't sure what the exact fuel levels for the Falcon 9 second stage would be when in low Earth orbit, considering the payloads all had to go to the moon, or that we may in fact actually need to expend the first stage for any of the flights. So we just did every launch properly to ensure we didn't accidentally do anything impossible by mistake. But now, we were only launching stuff to low Earth orbit, something proven to be very possible with the Falcon. Specifically, we would launch the Mars Habitat, Rover, and Mars Ascent Vehicle. 
of those three, the ascent vehicle was the heaviest. So we decided to only do that launch properly. And for the other two, we just used cheats to teleport the payload and Falcon 9 upper stage directly to low Earth orbit. And on screen, you can see the teleporting and subsequent docking of the Mars habitat, cocooned in its atmospheric entry protection shell. After docking, the whole ship was placed on a trans-atmospheric orbit so that the Falcon 9 upper stage could be detached and left to be destroyed by re-entry, and then the Mars transfer vehicle could restore the orbit of the ship. We then did the same thing again for the Mars rover module. Again, you can't see it. It's inside its atmospheric protection shell, but there it is docked, and there is the Falcon 9 upper stage being detached, and there is the Mars transfer vehicle restoring the ship to a safe orbit once again. And then it was time for the final launch of Phase 3. To reiterate, this was the Mars Ascent Vehicle, which, while being launched with only minimal fuel, was still the heaviest payload of Phase 3. So we decided to launch the rocket properly this time. The previous two teleports we made to orbit were accepted and approved by the judges, by the way. Uh, we did make sure to check before we did that. <laughs> anyway, also included in the Falcon 9 payload fairing was a small satellite which we would deploy in polar Mars orbit to serve as a relay sat and a resource scanner for the surface so we could pick an ore-rich landing spot for the Mars Ascent vehicle. However, the satellite wasn't part of the original design for this ship, and it was only when we started the docking process that we realised we would have to leave the Falcon 9 upper stage in orbit orbit because this craft only has one docking port and it's what the upper stage is currently attached to. However, because this is real solar system, the upper stage is technically in a low earth orbit that would decay in real life. So hopefully this is an acceptable mistake. That upper stage shouldn't stay in orbit for too long in real life. <laughs> As you can see, the docking process here was a little bit fiddly, but uh, we got there in the end. Hang on, wait for it, wait for it. Boom. The vehicle is now fully assembled in low Earth orbit, which means it's time to finally go to the moon. That's right, the, the transfer vehicle no longer has enough Delta V to do the mission. We've got to go back to the gateway station, refuel it, and then we can go to Mars. Well, actually, before that, we needed to refuel as well. So we had a cheeky Domino's pizza for getting back to things. First up was to wait it out for a Mars transfer window, something made easy thanks to the transfer window planner mod that the competition organisers had kindly installed on everyone's machines. Then, it was all just a matter of execution. We departed the moon for the final time, ready to conduct our Earth escape burn. I'm now going to show the next steps of the mission in slightly less abridged form so you can get a sense of the journey that we embarked on that took us all the way from Earth to Mars. So, let's -a go. I don't know why I said it like Mario. After plotting an initial maneuver node, we conducted the escape burn that would let us leave Earth's sphere of influence. This got us a fairly gross encounter with Mars, but our trajectory wasn't particularly close to the planet, which is where we wanted it to be, since we'd be doing no error breaking to capture, so we needed to make the most of the O-Birth effect. So, a mid-course correction burn was conducted to get our ship to do a nice close pass to the planet. We then plotted a third maneuver node to circularize at Mars. And with all that completed, there was nothing else left to do prior to our arrival at Mars. So, we lined up the ship along the maneuver node marker on the nav ball, then we whacked time warp onto its highest setting and watched our plucky little ship hurtle its way to its destination on the map screen. As we closed in on Mars, everything started to feel real. It had been so many hours of planning and setting up infrastructure to reach this point. Now, everything was finally coming to a head. Would everything work as planned? We were about to find out. At this stage, I admit I was a little bit apprehensive about the amount of Delta V remaining in the Mars transfer stage. Obviously, the number on screen there is far too low to get back to Earth, but don't forget it's still attached to all those heavy payloads that are soon going to be detached and landed on Mars. At this stage, we didn't actually know how much Delta V the transfer vehicle would have once everything was detached and it had to get back to Earth on its own. So there was still a chance that all of our plans could go wrong. Speaking of things going wrong, this is where we encountered our first critical blunder. While we were establishing our communications and resource scanning satellite, we realized we'd forgotten the solar panel for it, so it ran out of battery. So I'm just gonna skip through that failed little endeavor and get to kind of 
the more important and what I think more exciting part of this mission, and that is, of course, landing all the stuff on Mars. Now, if you remember all the way back at the beginning of this video, which uh, is a, turning out to be a lot longer than I planned it to be, uh, you'll remember that the challenge for this esports competition was to land 10 tons of cargo on Mars. You may have gathered at this point that me and Beardy Penguin decided to go a little bit above and beyond in this case, and we're landing a lot more than 10 tons. Specifically, we're landing 45 tons of infrastructure on the surface of Mars. What's the point of playing this game professionally if you can't flex a little bit, you know? Now, because our resource scanning satellite uh, didn't work, we didn't really know where to land the Mars Ascent Vehicle, so I said, let's just deorbit anywhere and just hope that we land somewhere with ore. Uh, accidentally landing in like the most mountainous region of Mars as you can see but hey we're in kind of like a little flat bit it's it's sliding it's sliding hang on it's not sliding as much now so we can <laughs> deploy the drill and see if we're getting any ore now don't forget all of this infrastructure is to support a crewed mission to Mars obviously the transfer window for that has passed it's gonna be another two years before the crew can get here so even if the ore rate is very, 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 very slow, the vehicle ultimately has two years to refuel itself. With the first landing complete, it was then time to deorbit the rover. Now, one of the primary reasons why we chose to include a rover among the inventory of things we were landing on Mars is because then it didn't really matter too much if the habitation module ended up landing miles away from the ascent vehicle because, you know, the rover can just ferry crew between the two. So we decided as long as the vehicles were kind of, sort of, close together, it was fine. Also, we had the plan that if we couldn't get anything to land close together, our interpretation of the whole, if you prove something works, you can do it again using cheats, was that once we'd landed all three modules on the surface of Mars, we could then teleport all three again on the surface of Mars, but have them close together. So that's our interpretation of the rules. If that's not allowed, well, we've got that previous explanation that the rover can just drive the crew between the two places. It's got to go down a bit of a steep hill. As you can see, I've once again landed in a mountain, and I kind of messed up the landing because I thought the red circle marked ground level, but actually, as you can see, it was hovering slightly above it. So then I had to quickly uh, detach the sky crane in a panic, and there was an explosion, but nothing on the rover was damaged. So really, it was just an efficient destruction of the sky crane, if you ask me. Anyway, with the rover and Mars surface ascent vehicle landed, the only thing left to land was the habitation module, which I'm just uh, showing you guys here. I didn't think you'd need to see an entire atmospheric entry all over again, but there is the touchdown. Now we just need to inflate the side compartment, deploy the solar panel, and of course, extend the communications tower. And with that, the challenge was technically complete. We'd landed all of the tonnage that we wanted to land on Mars, on Mars, but of course, as we say at Beardy Brits, we play for keeps. We wanted to make sure that we could get the Mars transfer vehicle back to Earth to not only prove that this entire mission was completely reusable and sustainable, but also so that we could send crew to actually use the infrastructure that we put in place. As you can see, not a huge amount of Delta V remains, 1,248 meters per second in fact. So we were definitely going to be running on fumes, but as long as we could capture into any kind of Earth orbit, the Lunar Transfer Fuel Shuttle Vehicle will be able to head on out into Earth orbit, dock with it, give it a bit more fuel, and uh, everything can go back to the Gateway Station and properly fill up with fuel. Then it would just be a matter of executing Phase 3 of our epic plan sending the crew to Mars, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We've got to make sure that the Mars transfer vehicle can indeed get back to Earth. We have an encounter with Earth, not a very close pass of Earth though, so there's going to be a mid-course correction burn, just so that we're getting nice and close to the blue planet. Uh, you can't see it on the map screen there because it's encountering multiple spheres of influences and KSP can't show the line that far ahead of the chain for some reason, but we are definitely close passing Earth, so everything was looking good. We've got just under 600 meters per second of Delta V remaining. It should, in theory, be enough to just about capture. Let's, uh, let's take a look. Oh, ain't that a beautiful sight? Aurora Borealis uh, greeting us with a 500 meters per second circularization burn, giving us a massive budget of 77 meters per second to spare. Now, we could have saved fuel in a couple of ways. Firstly, we could have done any kind of air braking, uh, either Mars 
or when we got back to Earth to save a bunch of fuel. And also, we accidentally brought an extra three tons to Mars by mistake, because I guess the game auto-filled the ore tank on the lander, uh, and so it, it, we kind of went there with a full ore tank, so that was a bit of a shame. But hey, look at that! We have captured at Earth. Although we didn't do it, mathematically, the lunar lander has the Delta V to go out and dock with the Mars transfer ship to refuel it, so all in all, we were happy that all of that was proven. Then, we moved on to phase three. It was gone midnight by the time construction of the crew vehicle began, but I was in my element slapping this thing together. We had a few parameters to bear in mind with its construction though. Firstly, it needed capacity for three crew members. Secondly, it should have a fairly sufficient space for them to live in reasonable comfort for the journey to and from Mars. And thirdly, I felt that for realism's sake, it should have some sort of means of mitigating against ophthalmic complications and bone and muscle losses by having an artificial gravity section, which was constructed using pistons and a rotor piece. An additional parameter was that it should obviously be launchable on our Falcon 9, and it should also not be heavier than anything we'd already launched. The reason for this was that it meant that all we'd need to do was launch it to low Earth orbit and then... As per the rules permitting teleporting, we could just teleport the Mars transfer vehicle to dock with it, and then considering that the mass the Mars transfer vehicle had moved from Earth to Mars in Phase 2 was far greater than the mass of the crew vehicle, we again considered it within the rules of the competition to then just be able to teleport the vessel directly to Mars orbit. And then it was just a matter of deorbiting the landing module, which we could prove was possible, and then and this is more for the photo opportunity and the fact that we intended to make a nice eye-catching YouTube video of this mission, teleport all the Mars infrastructure to be in nice close proximity to each other for the crew to then do all the sciencing and astronaut stuff on Mars' surface. Time really was of the essence at this point, and since we'd proven the Mars surface return vehicle could easily reach orbit again with enough fuel to dock to the crew transfer vehicle, and the Delta V remaining in the crew transfer vehicle was more than enough to do an Earth return, and the fact it was like 1 o'clock in the morning at this point, we declared our mission a success and completed. Then it was time to make the presentation to present to the judges, but we were kind of knackered at this point, we we're a bit pooped, exhausted, if you will. So we made the executive decision to uh, leave our PC, uh, walk the 10 minutes to our hotel and get a good four hours of rest and then tackle the presentation in the morning, feeling hopefully a little bit more refreshed. In the end, we got a good four hours of shut-eye and returned to the event hall the next day, running on some hastily stuffed down croissants and coffee, and then it was time to prepare our mission presentation. Now, in the interest of keeping things fair, we weren't allowed to use a laptop for multitasking, and so while I was busy flying the missions, Ollie had been diligently crunching some numbers on pen and paper beside me to give us lots of statistics to throw around during the presentation to showcase how economical all of our infrastructure would be and how it would eventually just pay for itself. Then, when it came to grabbing the screenshots for the slideshow, we'd been creating tons of named quick saves at every critical point in the game, so it was just a question of loading the relevant save to grab the screenshot and paste it into the slideshow. It didn't take us very long to get a 37 slide presentation completed, and with only a minute or so to spare, we were finally, 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 <laughs> completely done. Three, two, one. Thank you everybody for participating. <laughs> All the teams were then split into two groups that went to two different seminar rooms for round one of the presentations. From each of the two groups, only two teams would go forward into the final, presenting to all teams and judges in the main auditorium. I think our presentation went pretty well. We went to Brady Brits. Sorry we're British. We went a little over the 10 tons, but that was supposed to just be, you know, something to aim for. Uh, in the next slide, we figured out uh, what the performance was with all the lunar infrastructure, so the only important number really is, is that one, so it was 28 to 1,000 tons equivalent of CO2 emissions. And then on the next slide, if you did it without the lunar infrastructure, obviously it would be cheaper. But then if you do multiple missions, uh, you can see after six missions, your sort of total then actually breaks even, so it pays for itself. So after six missions to Mars, uh, it's worth having lunar infrastructure, and it's a much more sustainable way of exploring Mars. Okay.
next time you'll only will have six hours. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's most impressive, the amount of stuff you managed to do in 24 hours, or the, the amount of slides you managed to do. <laughs> we answered a few of the questions from the judges who seemed satisfied with our answers, and then everyone went back to the auditorium and it was announced who the final four teams would be. First group, it's uh, Ceres and uh, the Bernie Brits. Yay. So yes, we were in the final four, so we got to present again to everyone this time. I figured that you guys would want to see the presentation in full as well, so I'll let this play out uncut, though I am slightly aware that this video is already 7 billion hours long, so if you're not that bothered about watching the presentation, then you can skip forward to 51 minutes and 8 seconds. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is the presentation. Hello, so we are the Beardy Brits. English, not French, just because we're English and stupid. Um, yeah, um, maybe Brits, because we're British and we couldn't bother to shake. Um, go to the next slide. So, my name is Matt Lau. Uh, I was the flight director for our team. My name's Ollie, also known as the Beardy Penguin Online, and I was the mission architect, so to speak. So, we used a Falcon 9 for every single spacecraft we launched. Uh, we want to keep our mission as realistic as possible, and by reusing the first stage, we were able to save 225 tons of CO2 per launch, which isn't much, but it all starts to add up. The fuel cost really ended up being the most expensive part, sustainability-wise. Um, so we didn't actually reuse the second stage, but we did make sure we deorbited it either into Earth or into the Moon uh, to make sure we didn't generate any space debris. So we had three phases to our plan. We went a little bit overboard. Uh, did a bit more than just 10 tons to Mars. So our first phase was lunar infrastructure, consisting of a space station, a surface base, and then a fuel shuttle between them. As we said, the fuel is the most expensive part, so we try to mine as much as possible and it's free. The second phase was our Mars infrastructure, so we had not only a transfer vehicle, but a habitat and a rover, which themselves were more than 10 tons, and then we also sent a crew ascent vehicle and then in the third phase, we also did a full crew mission to take advantage of that infrastructure uh, and show how using the moon uh, would actually lead to a more sustainable Mars exploration program. So in the first phase, we have our Galileo Gateway. Uh, we have the cost and the mass of each of our spacecraft, so the cost, again, is in tons uh, of CO2 produced by launching it, uh, not including the cost of the Falcon 9, which each time we launched was 3,400. Next, we have our mining base, which is a mobile base that we landed at Shackleton Crater at the south pole of the moon. Then after that, we had our shuttle that moved between them, so it could transport 87 tonnes of propellant. And once it was launched, it didn't need to be replaced, it could just keep transporting fuel between the surface and the orbiting space station. So, into phase two, we have our transfer vehicle, essentially just a giant fuel tank with an engine. It was the same size as our fuel shuttle, essentially, so we could fuel it entirely with one trip. We launched it without much fuel in it, and then fueled it at the gateway, and we'll see a bit more of that later. After that, we have our habitat and our rover, so in order to fit them into the fairings, uh, the habitat is actually inflatable, we use some robotic parts for that, uh, and the habitat um, was landed with its own power, and the rover uses a sky crane. Then we have our crew return vehicle, which makes its own fuel on Mars. In reality, that would be the Sabatier process, but uh, of course using drills and ore here uh, to work with the limitations of the Hubble Space Program. Then finally, we have our crew mission. Uh, we've got, well, we've got all this infrastructure. Let's launch a mission, land some crew on Mars, see how much it takes to launch that, and then see how many crew missions would it actually take before that breaks even, or using the moon then actually cause you to have a much more sustainable program than just going directly to Mars. So Matt's going to walk you through the execution of that mission. Thank you. So yeah, so just to give you an overview of the Falcon 9 in action, so obviously it goes round one, two, three, four. So one is the launch. Two is the detachment. I don't know how clear it is to you guys, but basically we always detach the Falcon 9 uh, first stage with 900 meters per second remaining. That gave us plenty of fuel to make landing back by the Kerbal Space Center, same distance of recordings, of course, in picture four. And then past the first phase was the gateway station, which was a monolithic station inserted into a uh, polar moon orbit. So there it is there. So you can see it's arriving by the Falcon 9 second stage. Uh, that was then put on a sub-orbital jet around the moon, so it could be detached 
crash, but the station itself could use its boost engine to normally maintain its orbit, to get back into a safe orbit, basically. And then three is it will deploy, four is the result of our ore scan. So then we can do the mining base mission. So picture one is it arriving at the moon, again, by Falcon 9 second stage, which we can then deorbit. Detach, and then picture two, you can see the sky crane just about that lands the, uh, the rover on the surface. It's got those landing legs that not only brace the landing to protect the wheels, but they also have sensitivity once it's arrived at its mining location, which you can see in picture four is the edge of the, uh, the Shackleton crater. You've got those solar panels and radiators deployed. And the next slide is the arrival of the fuel shuttle. So this uh, didn't get there by Falcon 9 second stage. It's much, it's the heaviest payload basically. So Falcon 9 second stage just re-entered Earth's atmosphere. And because this is basically just a fuel tank and nothing else, it is easy enough fuel to reach the moon, landed by the uh, mining base, which then connected to it via that robot arm, and then it could reach orbit again and dock to the Gateway Space Station in picture three. Here is the arrival of the transfer vehicle. So there it is arriving by Falcon 9, second stage. Uh, this goes by now. There it is docked. So the two orange tanks of the uh, lunar shuttle are exactly the same as the two fuel, two fuel tanks on the interplanetary transport stage. It's nice and easy to just transfer all the fuel across. And then orbital assembly. So all of those units that Molly talked about are inside those three kind of uh, protective aero pods there that will enter Mars atmosphere individually. So they were assembled. Oh, I'm just back to the previous slide, sorry. <laughs> so they were all assembled in the top picture in low uh, orbit, but then at that point there wasn't sufficient delta V to get to Mars right away. So the second picture at the bottom, um, we went back to the moon base, refueled at the gateway station again, went to the uh, lander there, and then the whole thing then had enough fuel to get to Mars. Which uh, well, there is leaving the station, the, yeah, the space station. Yep, yeah. <laughs> there it is, arriving at Mars. So we didn't use any aero captures or anything. It was all done under engine power. There is one picture there of one of the modules entering the atmosphere. I think that's the uh, rover. So it's in that protected aero shell. You can see the top bit there. That's got the deorbit engines that allowed it to separate from the full sequence and deorbit and get down to the surface. So uh, those are the three modules. On the left is the habitation module. So we've got the inflatable docking port with those two arms. We kind of like make those like a simulated inflatable module. So they kind of extend out by pistons. I've got that extendable aerial tower there. We have the lander, which we use in situ resource utilization to refuel, whilst we wait for kind of two years to elapse for the next mass transfer window for the crew. And then the rover is also there. That landed by a sky crane and parachute. Uh, so, uh, yeah, unfortunately, because of time constraints, Kerbal Space Program landing stuff on a large celestial body with an atmosphere, it's a bit more trial and error, rather than being able to go anything accurately without additional mods, which obviously uh, we couldn't install. So, we aimed for kind of 30 kilometer separation ish between the modules, which I think we did, which um, you know, works because we have the rover that can transport crew between the HAB module and the VSF uh, module. So, it all worked, but we thought for like you know, artistic liberty, we thought we'd like showcase what they would look like together. So on the next slide, our interpretation of the rules that once you've established things can do what we said they can do, we can then, you know, put them where we actually wanted them to be. So that's the whole thing there. So you can see the, the drill is deployed from the Mars Ascent stage. For the next two years, I can just generate its own fuel. And then two years later, we get to the next Mars transfer window, so we can do the, uh, the crewed mission. Okay, uh, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> we left the Mars transfer vehicle in Mars orbit. We can then get that back to Earth. So it's a bit of a, a messy screenshot, but you can just about see. So Mars is kind of that orangish body on the right. You can see the blue line for the transfer vehicle to get back to Earth. And the next picture should yep, show it arriving back at Earth. Again, I'm sure Delta read out, Delta read out, so it's quite visible, but there is enough Delta read there basically to circularize the Earth without requiring air braking. And then once it's captured, the, uh, the shuttle at the gateway station can then capture it, refuel it, and reuse it, basically. So then the crewed missions, there it is, launching by Falcon 9. There it is, uh, arriving at Mars. Uh, we've got those two arms there that kind of extended out, and that rotates it's on a servo, so the astronauts can kind of be in there, so it can be a simulated 1G environment to protect things like bone and muscle density loss and retinal problems. And there is uh, touching down kind of red dragon star. We've got those retro rockets and we've got some parachutes just to help it out. And then there's the crew, Atara, 
little base area. <laughs> and then that's the upper stage of the Mars Ascent Vehicle. So it's kind of a two-stage thing. The bottom stage has all the mining and stuff and engines that can land itself propulsively. And then that's the upper stage that just attaches on lift up like the Apollo lander. It gets back to orbit. There's a, oh, just go back a second. So uh, again, the orbital stuff at the top, and that's a circuit orbit that's got over a kilometer per second of velocity remaining. So enough to rendezvous with the uh, transfer vehicle, which is all we need to do. And then I'll hand you back over to Ollie to do some maths. <laughs> so while Pat was doing his fancy flying, I was there with a pen and paper doing lots of maths. So uh, yeah, our rover and habitation module together already went sort of over the 10 ton target. We thought that was a sort of a, a minimum target, um, but we did it more than that. Uh, we obviously had the ascent vehicle as well, so we sent 25 and a half tons to the Martian surface in our sort of first mission. And then a uh, lot of numbers here. The only important one really is that uh, the cost of landing everything with seven launches of the Falcon 9 for the infrastructure uh, was 28 and a half ish thousand tons, uh, with 174 tons of pallet being mined from the moon. Then sending the mission with an extra Falcon 9, sending the crew using that infrastructure is a further uh, 4,000. But then now you have that infrastructure established, it only takes 8,000 tons, I say only, to launch a new crew module and a new Mars ascent vehicle each time you want to use that to go to Mars. So it's 8,000 tons. So we thought we'd compare that with the cost of going directly to Mars, you'll see that the initial cost is lower, but each subsequent mission has to launch a new transfer vehicle and be fully fueled as well, and that really starts to add up. So if we go to the next slide, we see after five missions, it breaks even. So you have the cumulative cost of sending more missions. By the time you send your sixth mission to Mars, um, you are being much more sustainable than going directly there. So essentially proving that, yes, it is worth using lunar infrastructure to support your Martian exploration program. Thank you for putting up with us. I didn't find the time to do all of that. Uh, lots of muscle memory, particularly on Matt's part, if you want to add some Caffeine, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that was our presentation. In summary though, to summarise everyone else's efforts, when watching the other presentations and just generally nosying in on people during the event itself, me and Dolly realised that we had gone a, a tad overboard with our mission. We were the only team to land more than 10 tonnes of cargo on Mars, the only team to provide infrastructure to do a crew return mission, and one of only a minority to send any crew at all in the first place. I guess the two of us playing the game on what is essentially a professional level for close to a decade, and the fact that Ollie also happens to have a master's degree in spacecraft engineering made us a bit overqualified for the esports event. But still, we waited with bated breath as the winning team was announced. Admit this is a bit humiliating, uh, but you were really the best. Uh, so I want to thank you for entering that much French for. But that wraps up my video of our big esports trip. Huge thanks to all the organisers for putting such an amazing event together, and of course, big thanks to my teammate, the Beardy Penguin. He made a much more succinct video of the esports trip, so do check that out through the link at the top right of the video or in the description. And after all was said and done, we were in Paris, so me and my girlfriend Beth had to go up the Eiffel Tower. Unfortunately, Beth is scared of heights, and there was a rainstorm when we did it, so it wasn't uh, pleasant. So Beth, how are you finding the Eiffel Tower? Isn't it nice? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Come on, Beth, let's go and conquer your fears. <laughs> so scary. This is so intense. So much. <laughs> I'm actually enjoying it now I've got used to it. So in fact, we went back the next day to watch the sunset from the top after the rain had cleared, and the view was much, much better this time. But yeah, that's the end of the video, so I'll leave you with these beautiful sunset shots of Paris while I give a big shout out to all my supporters on Patreon and my YouTube members program. They make all of this content possible. I really hope you all enjoyed this video. It took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to make, and it ended up being nearly an hour long. 
If you want to watch the 10 minute version, then Beardy Penguins is the upper card that you can click on on screen. I highly recommend it. I think our videos do complement each other. And the bottom card is a video picked for you by the algorithm, so that's hopefully going to be worth a watch as well. Thank you so much for watching once again, and I'll see you in the next one.